So I'm James Foster, and uh, we're going to talk about running Faro on the VM, I, on the Gemstone VM. But first, I'd like to give you a brief introduction to Gemstone. There's traditional small talks have advantages in client, GUI, and other things. Some of the disadvantages that I'm looking at is that the object space is limited to what you can get into RAM. The object space is visible from only one virtual machine. When you want to share objects between different images or virtual machines, it's complicated. You need to export, import. There's not a very convenient way of moving things. And you can convert it to a binary format, XML, or some other things, but you run various challenges and risks about importing and exporting that uh, can end up with duplicates or too much or loss or something. And if your virtual machine quits or crashes, then you're going to lose the data. So in Gemstone, we have object space limited by disk rather than by RAM. So as much disk space as you have, uh, up to a certain design limit, you'll be able to put into the object space. Object space is shared across multiple VMs running on multiple hosts. So multiple sessions can access the same shared object space. And we have transactional persistence. So once a transaction's been committed, then it will be saved to the database and not lost. So this gives you more of that security. The architecture is um, somewhat complicated to make all this happen. We have lots of processes that are running and they are interacting with each other in various ways that uh, we manage for you. But uh, these are some of the uh, processes, memory, disk, communication, and other uh, hosts that can be running. So you can have an application communicating with a gem, interacting with the database. You can have another application interacting with two gems. And uh, so multiple sessions through one user. We have different types of gems, linked and remote procedure. They can all exist on one machine. They can be separated by a network so that you can have your application on a separate machine, which is the traditional client server model that is used extensively by most of our longtime clients. You can rearrange the architecture so that you have your two machines uh, using different resources so that the gem is on a separate machine from the host, from the stone host. And then there's a three machine configuration where you can have the client, the gem, and the stone each on separate machines. So some complexity there. We also have a shared page cache that holds copies of data from disk in memory and makes it available to the gems that want to interact with it. So the topic we have is replacing base classes. How do we replace base classes? If we've heard a few talks here about some history today, and one of the things I find interesting in the history is that a goal for Gemstone was, excuse me, a goal for Smalltalk was the ability to explore, experiment, try out different language features. And we sometimes point out that even iteration, flow control, is not part of the language. It is something that is in the class library. So that gives you a chance to experiment with a different naming convention, syntax, for some of these things. And so these base classes are important. In fact, they're vital. 
But what if you want to experiment with different base classes? How complicated is that going to be? Well, we do have some portability issues as well that we'd like to address. Right now, there is something called ANSI that gives you a base class library. That is being fairly well supported, I think, by most of the small talks, at least the, the ones that I'm familiar with. And Gemstone certainly tries to come as close as we can to matching ANSI. For Seaside, one of the things that got developed was something called Greece. Greece is a dialect portability layer. So that if you make calls to Greece classes rather than to base classes, then it will handle things for you. So that's another advantage. But there's an interest in experimenting, maybe try out at a lower level. What could we do at a low level to actually replace base classes? So we're going to experiment here with one example. And this is not necessarily the only approach, but uh, we're going to look at some ideas of how would you go about replacing a base class library. Well, one model is just replace it. But uh, that's, that's kind of hard, because it's hard to take out a ray from your existing class library. It's hard to take out objects, undefined object, um, association, various things like this. You can't, you can't just remove class from your image and uh, put in a new one and start experimenting. In most small talks, you, act, you can't start with an empty image. You have to start with something already in it. And that thing in it is the base image that you start with. In order to add your own code, you send messages to existing objects. You create new classes that way. You create new methods that way. It happens that Gemstone takes a different approach. When we are building a base gemstone image, we start with a completely empty image. And we have C library functions that you can call to create new methods. So we can, uh, now we have our compiler in C rather than in Smalltalk, which for many reasons is a disadvantage, but here it gives us an advantage. So we could start with something empty and just install one class at a time and one method at a time. The, the challenge for that is it's going to be extremely difficult to debug. And even though you can start with what purports to be an empty image, there are classes that are known to the virtual machine. So even though we try to think of classes as being defined in small talk, some of them actually have to be known at the virtual machine level. So that's going to create a challenge for us. Option two is what I will call a parallel class hierarchy. Now again, in most small talks, you have a single namespace, or the traditional ones. Uh, now we have um, some, uh, VisualWorks has a, namespaces where you can have two classes named array. Gemstone also has this and has had it from the beginning. So we could create a parallel class hierarchy. And you could have a class object, a class array, a class ordered collection, and so on. There's the way we implement this will help you understand if we look first at the traditional method lookup, I'm sorry, global lookup, name lookup. So in the traditional name lookup for a traditional client, Smalltalk, that does not support namespaces, you have your image, a system dictionary, and the system dictionary references 
a series of associations, and those associations have key value pairs. So if you want to look up something, you start with the system dictionary and go from there. In Gemstone, we have a root, but instead of it being the small talk system object that holds on to a symbol, one symbol dictionary, we have a collection of users. Each user has a user profile. Each user profile has a symbol list, which is an array of dictionaries. And within the dictionaries, we have our associations that have the key value pairs. So not the symbol dictionaries are depending on the symbol list of the user profile you select. So right now, in order to do a name lookup, you need to go through a, a, an array of symbol of dictionaries and look in the first one to see if the global you're looking for is found, look in the second one, look in the third one, and so on. So yes, that is the way name lookup is done. So we can have multiple dictionaries, and the built-in array need only exist in one of them. And, or you could not even have it be visible to your user at all. You could have a user that does not see the systems array, but sees your own array. These dictionaries, associations, globals, and so on, can have a rather complex relationship. So users, I've given us two users, Bob and Carol. Bob has a symbol list with a series of dictionaries, and Carol has a symbol list with a series of dictionaries. Now, of course, in small talk, objects point to other objects, and they can be shared. So notice that globals and published are both pointed to by the respective symbol lists. Is this the controls? Do you want to try focusing just a little more? <laughs> um, or else I need new glasses. Um, Yeah, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll see. So, Bob, though, has a separate user globals than Carol. So, you can have your own dictionary that other users don't see, but you can also have a dictionary that the users share. And, of course, the shared one, if one person user makes a change to publish, then it will be visible to the other users. The symbol associations can also be used in rather creative ways. So Bob's symbol list can have a user global that has an association that has a key and a value. And Carol's symbol list can have an association that has a key and a value. So here we actually have separate associations with the same key and the same value. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's perfectly legal. Um, you could also have separate associations that have different keys, but the same value. So Bob could be looking at array and get the class array. Carol could look at the global named list and get the class array. It's just a name, it's just a lookup, it's just an association. So this is, you know, completely reasonable. Uh, well, it's completely possible, maybe a little not quite so reasonable, but it's possible. You can also have separate key associations that have the same key, but different values. So Bob can use the symbol ordered collection to point to a class named ordered collection. Carol can have an association that has a key that points to the symbol ordered collection and the value of a different class called ordered collection. 
So we can have the same name for two different things, as long as it's in a separate symbol dictionary. So that's, that's completely doable. So one could generate a completely parallel hierarchy. There's some problems with that. One thing is literals. When the compiler compiles literals, it assigns those literals to an existing class that the compiler virtual machine knows about. So we're back to, and, and there's other things known to the VM. So arrays, blocks, booleans, byte arrays, characters, floats, small integers, strings, symbol, undefined, these are all things known to the compiler as well as some internal kind of plumbing support classes, behavior class, meta class, exception, pragma, process, process scheduler. These are things known to the virtual machine and you could create classes with those names and you could put methods in them, but you wouldn't get those classes if you put literals in source code. So, we also have, if, if you're using the same class, we've got challenges with different implementations. So it turns out in Faro has a nice optimization, and I think many other small talks do, has a nice optimization that if you say print string to an array, literal, it will give you an array literal that could actually be source code for that string. Um, for whatever reason, Gemstone doesn't have that little feature in it, and we just have a very generic implementation of print string that puts out the class name and the elements separated by commas. Okay? So we've got separate implementations. So if you use the same class, you want to have separate methods. <clears throat> Gemstone has a feature called parallel methods, or what I'm calling parallel methods. Um, we, we can insert additional methods into what, you, what we call an environment. And so a method is compiled into an environment or is associated with an environment at the time it's compiled. And then when the method is executed, it looks for other methods that are in the same environment. Okay? And we have, uh, by default, the existing everybody is in environment zero unless they try ask for something else. This feature was put in initially for maglev, so environment one is reserved for Ruby methods, but two and on are available for use. So I'm using two, environment two for Faro in this example. So what does this do for us? How does this work? Well, let's start with, again, a, a traditional small talk method dictionary implementation. We have array. It inherits from arrayed collection. It inherits from sequenceable collection. Array has a method dictionary. If the method that you're looking for is not found in array, then it will look in arrayed collection. Then it will look in sequenceable collection and on up. Okay, likewise, we have a similar situation for the class side. Gemstone has something different, so kind of watch the green and the added... Um, so far, this is fairly similar. What you see changed is the array no longer inherits from arrayed collection. We don't have an arrayed collection. We have... a sequenceable collection, so we skip that step. But array has each, um, each class has not just one dictionary, but 
an array of dictionaries. So again, we're following kind of the computer science model of any time you want to support something, throw in an extra level of indirection. And so here we have not just one method dictionary, but an array of them. And so the method dictionary zero for array would be the gemstone implementation. Method dictionary two for array would be a Faro implementation. And furthermore, even if an array does not inherit from arrayed collection, the method dictionary for array can inherit from the method dictionary for arrayed collection. And so you see arrays method dictionary zero inherits from sequenceable collections method dictionary zero. Whereas arrays method dictionary two inherits from arrayed collections method dictionary two. So we have the capability of inserting method dictionaries that will be used instead. So some sample messages. If you're in environment zero and you send one, two, three print string, you get an array one comma two comma three. If you're in environment two, you get pound per in one, two, three. You can also explicitly identify the environment that you want to use using a non-small talky syntax of at environment number. There's some problems with using the gemstone classes. We might have a different schema. So ordered collection in Faro has an array, a start, and an end. In gemstone, we don't have any instance variables because we can implement array built in without any instance variables, just indexed. So that's a challenge. But ordered collection is not known to the compiler. So we can give you a different ordered collection class. So our options again, one is replace all the classes, two is use parallel classes exclusively, three is use parallel methods exclusively, and four is the hybrid. That's the path we're going down here. So you can get into things using Topaz, Gem Builder, uh, for small talk or some other tools that are available. This is not a complete solution. Um, you, even if you worked at it, and I'm going to show only the most trivial things, but Gemstone Virtual Machine is not completely able to replace the Faro Virtual Machine. There's some things built in that we don't handle. Uh, Faro has weak references. We don't. We have ephemerons. Um, Faro has some classes that have, are identified as being fixed as 32-bit in size, and we don't support that. Um, but let's take a look and give it a bit of a try. So I've got a five-minute demo and about six or seven minutes remaining. So I'm going to bring up my demo, go to this preview, and then play it. So what we're going to do here is download the Faro minimal image. The Faro minimal image is available here. Then we can open it up and take a look at it. And think about this as being a minimal image hundreds and hundreds of packages, thousands of classes, tens of thousands of methods. But that's what they call a minimal image. I'm going to go to Gemstone and grab a Gemstone 3.4 environment. And then I have a project out on GitHub where uh, this code is located. If you clone that, download it, or fork it, you'll see there's in this directory a script that says, given this Faro image, export the globals, the pools, the classes, and the methods. 
And so I'm going to open up my terminal, export them. It says there's 27 globals, 7 pools, 1,400 classes, 25,000 methods, and it creates text files that describe each of these. I'm going to give myself an initial gemstone base extent, start out with that, nothing else added to it. I'm going to start up that gemstone environment, and then I'm going to uh, take a look, make sure it's running. Yes, there's PIDs and it's, it's there. I'll go back to my terminal window and import the Faro classes into my gemstone environment. So here it creates new dictionaries, adds the classes, the globals, the various things, puts them all in nicely. Now I'm going to go over and log in using my IDE to go look at Gemstone and see what sort of things are there. So on my first tab, I'm going to look at built-in globals. So here are the built-in global classes that exist in Gemstone. And if you're familiar with Gemstone, you'll recognize these, but otherwise you don't have to worry about it too much because we're not here looking at Gemstone. But the next tab we have is going to look at a dictionary we're calling Smalltalk, which is what Faro calls its dictionary. And in that dictionary, we have a combination of base classes and Faro. So this will have all the classes that are defined. And we're going to specify to look in environment two at the methods. So here we're going to say, back in Gemstone, we're going to say, let's look at array. So here we have array. And then in our Faro environment, we're going to look at array. And they have different methods that are implemented. So in one environment, we need to go up to collection to find the implementation of printon. So printon is print recursive on. If we go over to our Faro environment, and there's a printon method in array, that has a particular implementation. So in our workspace, we're going to say one, two, three, print on, and we're going to get the gemstone implementation of print on. We can open a workspace in our Faro environment. We can say one, two, three, print on, or print string, and it gives us the Faro implementation of print string. We can also step into this in a debugger and look at the Faro code that we're executing. So again, we can even edit the Faro code, change the constant from 50,000 to 50,001. And so we are now using the gemstone debugging tools to step through Faro code. So you don't have to have everything working in order to start debugging things. You can use the environment, the tools, and work your way in, step through the debugger, look at code, look at methods, and here we are. So just run it, finish, and it gives us the things that we're looking for. We can say we want to look, you know, what methods need to be implemented? Well, we're going to go to Pragma and say there's Faro primitives. So here's a list of the primitives that are in Faro. And these are the ones that would be particularly needing help in order to re you know, re adapt them to the gemstone environment. But if you went through and uh, addressed each of these, then you'd have the primitives from Faro working, and the rest of the code is calling primitives. So that, in theory, uh, you know, there's only a small matter of implementation, but of, uh, you know, what I think is something like a thousand primitives and a few other details. But uh, here we are, 529, one minute. Questions? Yes. The 
size change from the total to the square root of the um, The least of the to show up on the primitives, not least of the primitives that uh, you guys from far. Uh, some of them, I guess, you already implemented for chapter or a chapter uh, the lack that you will have go for example for the proof stream. Yes. I, I had to modify something like a hundred methods in order to do this trivial demo. This, 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 is, this is actually, you know, a, a little bit harder than it looks. It's not just one or two methods. There's streams, there's next put, there's, yes, lots of stuff. Yes, yes, but there's a lot I haven't named. Okay, well, let me just grab this. <laughs> So that, that, okay, the question of could you take anything you did here in experiments and modifications and port them back to Faro? Um, I hadn't thought about that. Um, that's an interesting question, but it seems like at least if, if you could find a way to keep it running while you were doing it, it, it should be possible. Um, but. That would take some more exploration. Of course. And um, also, you can extract the base part of the image, not the entire part of the image of error, import it back to Shamsung, uh, modify that, and I uh, am not the entire. Well, I chose just for simplicity for me to start with something that was out there called the Faro minimal image. Now, I had hoped that it would be minimal. It's, uh, it has 1,400 classes and 25,000 methods. So I didn't find it minimal, but I didn't want to spend any of my time trying to decide what to bring over. I mean, this was a version of Faro that purported to be complete and self-contained. Now, it turns out, it was interesting in doing this, I found several dozen bugs in this, references to classes that don't exist. But again, it was enough for me to perform the experiment that I wanted to perform and, and to find something interesting to talk about at a conference, which uh, was, was my real purpose. Yes. And, you know, th this could be anything you want to experiment with. As I mentioned at the beginning, Smalltalk, one of its goals was language experimentation. And so I chose Faro for a demo, but, you know, the idea is you can use existing debuggers in an environment that doesn't yet have a debugger. And you can just edit the code in a debugger 
and then hit save and keep running. Well, time for the break and uh, be back at uh, 6 o'clock for the next session. But I'm here, Martin McClure is also from GemTalk Systems and uh, we are passionate about small talk, uh, we are passionate about gemstone and, uh, and others, other things. Um, what, we have lots of topics that we can discuss, but we're here to visit with you and talk. So please don't hesitate to come up and ask questions. <laughs>